And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Kelly Curry, who during her near-death experience interacted with energy beings, which we're going to talk about and more. Kelly, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate you asking me to be on here today. Well, we're happy to have you. And if you don't mind, let's start on the day you died and go from there. Thank you. So um, in 1984, I had a car accident that uh, created a lot of uh, uh, problems over the years um, that I had many, many surgeries, over 40 surgeries. And um, in 1998, I was working and uh, I had an accident at work, uh, fell off of a, a ladder and the issues and problems that had been ongoing in my spinal column uh, were exasperated on that day. And a couple of the discs that had already been in a, in a huge um, problem misalignment and with bulging and problems and stuff like that, they, they kind of blew out because of the way that I fell. And that left me paralyzed from the waist down. So I was uh, rushed to the hospital and um, by divine providence, uh, a doctor had just come from Johns Hopkins and was now practicing in Buffalo, New York, where I was living. And he looked at my injury and looked over my history. And he said, well, I had just piloted a new surgical uh, procedure for spines like yours, and I'd like to try it on you. And so I agreed to that. And it was during that surgery that I had my NDE. Uh, when I went into surgery, they had explained to me that it would be two parts, one going through the spine first and placing, um, taking out the, the bad parts and putting in some rods and pins and then turning me over and then completing the process from through my stomach. And when they rolled me over, I woke up. I did not know at the time that I was in the middle of the surgery. Um, I did know that I was waking up and because I'd had so many surgeries before, I knew that there was kind of like a, a series of things that would happen. Number one, they'd be saying your name, Kelly, Kelly, wake up, Kelly, it's time to wake up. Come on, let's come out of it. They would uh, be making noise. They would be checking your blood pressure and that kind of stuff. But none of this was happening on this particular time that I woke up. And I was very happy because I said, oh, I'm, I'm awake, but they're not bugging me. And this is really great. And uh, I was kind of relaxed and just laying there. And I was also trying to assess what had happened. Was I able to feel my toes? You know, I was just laying there quietly. And then I started to hear um, people talking close to me. And they started talking about the tattoos that I have. I have quite a few tattoos. And they're on my legs. And they were talking about the tattoos on my legs, which it, it caught my attention because I thought, well, that's kind of strange. They shouldn't be talking about that. And um, But they were talking about them as they were going up the legs. So as they started to get up into my hip area, I thought, well, why why are they doing that? That's, you know, this is not right. They shouldn't be talking about that. And so my, my attention was on them. And then I heard uh, the metal um, things that they use for the surgery, like you know, scissors and stuff hit the uh, metal plate. And I knew that that sound was normally the last sound I heard before I went out. And so at this moment, I said, oh, I haven't gone under yet. I must have, you know, I don't know why I don't remember, but I must not have gone under yet. Now go out now. So I start counting in my head, you know, five, four, three, I get to one and I'm not going out. And I said to myself, something's not right, but I still didn't understand. I'm a little bit angry because I'm listening to people talk about my tattoos. I'm confused because I don't know why I heard that noise, but I'm not going out. And then I felt them swab my stomach. And when I felt the swab on my stomach, I knew that they didn't know I was awake. And so I tried to open my eyes and I tried to move my body. And this is when I realized I can't open my eye. I, I tried to open my eyes. I thought I saw like some sort of like a, like a, blurry vision, but um, they assured me that that didn't happen. They also, uh, um, you know, I was trying to move my fingers or my hands to let them know I was awake. And so I was very concentrated on trying to let them know that I was, uh, uh, you know, aware. And that's when I felt the knife touch my stomach and it cut me nine inches all the way through the stomach, the skin and the muscle. And I felt the muscles on the back of my spine from where they cut on my stomach like like a rubber band and when they did that when that happened 
the amount of pain that I felt was so intense. And I, I really was, you know, I was screaming in my head, I'm awake, you know, I'm awake. I can, ah, and stop, stop. And then I felt like a hand go inside of me and I could feel like not the direct, like fingers or anything. I could just feel like a pressure of something going inside of my stomach. And that pain made me go out. But when I go out, I now am above my body and I'm looking down and I I can see there's a lot of flurry and a lot of action going on, but I don't know what's happening. But in a moment, I realized that I wasn't feeling any more pain. And I thought to myself, oh my God, I'm dead. You know, they, they killed me. You know, I thought they killed me. And, but the very next thought after I'm dead was, oh my God, I'm free. I don't, I don't want to be there. I don't want to be there at all. I I'm done with life. I'm done. I don't have to go back. I don't have to do anything else. It's like, I'm, I'm done. And there was a part of me inside that was very happy about this because the life that I was living was a, a, a very troublesome, painful, angry life. And I found nothing of redemption in the life that was going on around me or where I was. I was a very unhappy human being. And so uh, I was very happy to be uh, maybe not living anymore. And so uh, at that point, I just kind of am now asking myself questions about what does this mean? Like, where do I go? What's happening? And and I I heard a like a mental telepathy voice in my head, not my voice, say, you, you need to go back. And I was like, absolutely not. You know, like, I didn't know if it was my inner thinking what was talking to me, but I was like, no, I'm happy to be going. I don't want to go back. And, and the voice was very strong the next time and said, you, you must return to your body. And at this point, I dug my heels in and said, absolutely not. You do not want to return to this place. This place has no love. This place is angry. These people are mean. I'm not going to do it anymore. There's nothing. Re- why Why would God take his children, if we're his children, and send us down to this place, this hellhole? I have no, nothing I want to be there for. And so the next thing I know, um, I am now not in the space, because in the space that I was in, I was kind of like, the the scene of what was happening below was getting farther and farther from me is it wasn't happening quickly it was just kind of like starting to fade away and as that happened I was surrounded in a fog and the fog was like a very light greenish color it was it was very calming and and in that same moment I felt love in every atom of my body every cell of my body was filled up with love And as I felt that love kind of like enveloping me and taking over everything, all the pain I'd ever felt was gone. All the connections to people that, you know, you feel bad about leaving this one, all of that was removed. All of that was gone. There was, there was just nothing but a state of being that I had never felt in my entire life, which is complete and utter health, happiness, and clarity. And so In this fog, I am now hearing multiple voices in kind of like in 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 symphony saying, you need to go back down there. There's things left for you to do. And I said, I don't want to go back there. I'm not having a good life down there. And there's nothing I find worth staying there for. And so I think they knew that uh, I was giving them quite a bit of pushback. And at this point now, out of the fog, these beings appear around me. Now, they didn't get real close to me. They formed sort of a circle and they had uh, a, like an outline of a human form, but they were so bright and so brilliant of a color blue that if I tried to look at them and stare at them, the brightness was like almost too much for my eyes to take in. I could look in between the figures and see the figures standing there, but to look directly at the figure, I could not see uh, like an eyes or a nose or a mouth. It was just the outline of a figure but the the overwhelming feeling was the radiating of this love. They were all radiating this tremendous love to me. This this like being wrapped in a blanket, this being hugged by a million souls. Like it was a, a very beautiful feeling. And they said, no, you're not done and you need to go back. And we have something that we think we can share with you that will help you to understand. And in this moment, they downloaded so much information to me, so many understandings of, I call it the bigger picture, 
because it was like pulling me out of the life of earth and showing me how all of this was interacting, why things happened, how it took time, how the plan of the universe or God's plan might, you know, have a, have an ending, but it could take eons for this particular plan to go in that, you know, we're just all kind of playing a little role along this, this, this thing, this greater plan. And so they let me see that they let me understand that there was more going on and that nothing is what it seems. That was the very most important thing was nothing is what it seems. Everything you think you're seeing on the planet or you're experiencing, nothing is what it seems. And so as I'm trying to kind of understand, like a back of my head, I'm thinking, why are they showing me all this stuff? And I was confused about how this is supposed to be something for me. And in the next moment in front of me, what appeared was a spider web. And there was actually layers of spider webs. So you could see the bottom and you could see another one above it. And there was just these layers of spider webs, almost like a sandwich, but with air in between them. And they said, we want to teach you something about how, how you manifest or how things happen. And so they showed me on one spider web a word that I had spoken. And it showed that in the moment that the word, the thought that became the word came out of my mouth, it turned into like a lighted path on one of those strings on that um, spider web. And so I looked at that and, and I was trying to figure out why that was important. But after I said the word, I saw how the word touched another person because the word was heard by another human. And that human also having their own spider webs may or may not repeat the thing that I said. And what I learned was, if I said something beautiful and positive, like, oh, my God, you look so beautiful today, you look so radiant, and that light would light up on that on that particular string, and that person who heard it was more likely to say to another person, oh, my, you look so beautiful today, don't you look pretty? And there would be another lit line, and here would be this beautiful crystalline structure of like a spider web. However, on the other side, if I was to say something mean or nasty, like, you know, you're really ugly, or you're a horrible person or whatever, or you don't deserve something, then that line also went to that person. And I saw that person now repeating that energy or those words to other people. And that spider web had a whole different look to it. And so when I looked over all the different layers, I started to realize that all these layers of spider webs were words that had been spoken by me, and what had happened when they went out to other places. So once I saw the line, I could now look at that and see other spider webs as those other people. So people were passing on the words I was speaking. And I realized in that moment that I had not been speaking good words in my life, that I had not been giving out good messages to people or saying nice things to people more than the other. I was doing more of the mean stuff and less of the good stuff. And in doing that, I realized that the world that I hated so much, the thing that I didn't want to go back for, was my own making. They were coming from my words, from my thinking, from my expression. And I was only creating a world around me that was a complete and total reflection of the words and the things that I was giving out. Because I wasn't passing on great things to my children. I saw that. I was rough. I was hard. I was demanding. I was working two jobs. I was you know, like lots of parents, very stressed out, trying to figure out how to make the mortgage. And, and in doing so, I was just like angry all the time at everything I was doing. And I wasn't speaking nicely about the things that I wanted done. And I, I knew that I was creating my own problems. And that was a really large epiphany because I thought, oh, my Lord, like I can change this. I have the power to change this. I have the power to change what I'm thinking and what I'm speaking. And so in that love and in that understanding. And there was much more to that. There was so much that happened that over time, I forgot a lot of it. And um, I've spent a good part of my lifetime since then searching for that knowledge. And it is coming back. It is coming to me. I will, I will hear things or read things and I'll go, yes, yes, yes. That's something that they showed me. That's something that they told me. But I can't just sit down and download it to somebody because there was, it was just, it was too much really. But I did not forget about the spider webs. And so when I woke up, the first thing I said was, I was awake for the whole thing. I felt it. You know, I felt, I felt the knife. I felt the, I died. I died. And, and everyone around me was, you know, my family was around me. They're like, what is she talking about? What is she talking about? And so that started a whole little thing after the fact in which they sent me some psychiatrists. Um, this is, I, 
I now at this point believe that I was kind of this was maybe a newer thing that was happening at the time where people were talking about it. Uh, maybe it happened many times before that, but medical or science communities didn't really put anything to it. But at this time, when I was talking about it, they did send me some psychiatrists to talk to me, to ask me, you know, what happened and that kind of stuff. But I will say that every single one of them tried to tell me that it was the anesthetic, it was the drugs that they gave me, that I wasn't gone for very long, that they, uh, you know, hadn't given me enough of one of the drug and too much of the other. And that's what made all of this stuff happen. But that never sat right with me because it changed me in every atom of my body. And for a very long time, I could sit and meditate and and feel the divine love that had filled me. I, I'm not able to do that anymore. It happens occasionally if I if I give somebody a, a good word or share in some sort of love that's pretty grand, I might feel it for a second. But to just close my eyes and fill my body with it, it it's difficult. And so for a long time, though, I could do it. And so I, I didn't care what they said. You know, they they did try to poo-poo me and, you know, oh, that didn't happen and that kind of thing. Um, but I knew that it was real and I knew that it was going to change my life. And the moment that I got home, I started. I started with my children. I started with my family. Prior to my experience of that surgery, I uh, drank a lot. I did drugs. Uh, most of that was because for 14 years, I lived with a lot of um, physical problems from the accident. And I used that as my painkiller. And when I came back, I really didn't want any of those things anymore in my life. I didn't want to do those things to cover up how I felt. I wanted to feel my feelings and I wanted to change them through my speaking and change them through my thinking. And um, I lost a lot of people in my life because uh, I stopped hanging out at the same places. I stopped doing the same things and I was no longer somebody that they wanted to hang out with. I would try to talk about my experiences and even with people I had known for a long time. And they were like, come on, Kelly, you know, you, you were tripping. And um, and so I had no support around me for this change I was going through. I had been uh, in a marriage for 20 years. My husband, after about um, within the first year, accused me of being a Jesus freak <laughs> and uh, said that he wanted nothing to do with me. And uh, so we ended up splitting up. My children can't, were coming around. They liked the new mom that was more attentive and, and more easygoing. And um, and that's kind of the beginning of my whole change in my life that started to get me outside of my inside. I, instead of being in my head all the time and thinking such selfish or personal or greedy things, I was now a much more giving person. I started giving things away. I started giving you know extra furniture away and things that I would be very uh you know very uh, about prior to that experience like that's my stuff and and now I was like giving it away I was like you know what I don't need it somebody else needs it let me give it away and so all these changes in me um created these huge other changes going around in my world and before long everything started to fall apart so like I ended up losing my home because I wasn't working two or three jobs anymore and being gone all the time. I was like, I'm not doing that. I'm not working like that anymore. And well, there wasn't enough money to pay the bills. And so little by little, everything starts to kind of spiral and blow apart. And in this is where I find art in this, because I was, I was desperate. I was working in, you know, corporate America and I did not want that world anymore. And uh, I found myself praying more. Even though I had been raised a Catholic and went to Catholic school and stuff, I didn't believe in God before this experience. But there was no telling me God didn't exist after this experience because I felt the love that God had. And I knew exactly what it was when I felt it. And so I knew I had that strength behind me. I started reading a lot of things like I, I had never read the Bible, even though I had gone to church all those years. I read the Bible front to back. I read the Bhagavad Gita. I read the Quran. I just I just wanted to understand I knew something bigger was out there. Now I wanted to really dig deep and try to figure out how this, um, how I can connect to that and then show others, teach others, tell others that, hey, this life that you're living right now, this is something that you're creating through what you think and what you speak. And you can change that, that changes. And, um, and that there's more to life than the life that you can see right here, right now, that there's a, there's more connections. There's a, there's a whole invisible fourth dimension world, whatever you want to call it. Like it's one we can't see, but it's right there. And, um, and there's beings there that love us and support us and, and are, you know, there for us. If we, if we embrace that idea 
And of course, there's a lot of pushback because, you know, people are very scientific and they want to see it and they want to touch it and then they'll believe it. And the spirit world doesn't work like that. Spirit world works with believe it first and then it appears to you. <laughs> so it's kind of backwards to what humans think it should be. And um, and so my art has been a way of me becoming a, a deeper learner of these things. When I first set out on my art career after I had uh, met the the people that helped me to get there, um, I remember thinking to myself, you know, if if Jesus could walk, you know, in total faith that God would meet all of his needs, whether it was food or shelter or whatever, then why can't I try that? Why can't I try that? If I if I really have the faith that this will work, and I put myself through some tests, you know, I I lived in a car for a while. My kids were older by the time that this kind of happened, and so, um, you know, for a while they were doing their own thing, living in different places, and and so I I did this on my own. But I lived in my car for like a year while I was painting murals in the beginning, and and I I just kept trusting. It was very difficult. I cried a lot, and I journaled many 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 years of this experience because. I knew there was something greater and, and it kind of kept me on the search for how do I reconnect to that? And uh, so now this has become my life. And for uh, 20 something years, I've been creating art and talking to people about my experience, uh, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, not, not to groups or anything, but, you know, I might be walking down the street in a certain city and I'm painting a mural and that's when people will come up and talk to me and they see me outside doing public art and, they're they're gravitated towards me for whatever reason and within 10 minutes of conversation the reason is there and i realize i have something i can share with them to maybe help them out and um and uh, this has been an ongoing thing in my life now for a long time so i i feel like i'm at this kind of full circle in which i went through an experience that i really didn't know what to do with i've spent a good portion of my life trying to understand what happened to me and looking for information from other people to figure out, uh, you know, has anyone else been through this? And what did they do with what happened to them? Uh, did they turn it, did it, it, did it stay with them the rest of their life? You know, did they, did they stop believing at some point that what they have, what happened to them was real or not? And, um, you know, you kind of become a student of it. it it's uh, to have that experience, I think that puts you on a path to wanting to know more about it because it was such a grand experience. And so uh, I'm now, um, you know, I'm, I'm starting to write a book about my experiences and especially like how art became uh, something that I believe that, that the, those spirit guides gave to me, those angels or whatever they were. I think that they definitely helped me to find art because art set me free. Art got me out of the other world that I was in, and I have this freedom in my soul. I have this uh, joy for life every day that I get up. I love painting and drawing and creating, and it, it gives me a way to connect to people on a really great level. And um, and all of that was divine. How I even met the person that uh, that was through a lot of praying, Lord, what's my thing? What's, you know, what's for me? What is the thing I'll be good at? What's the thing I can do for the rest of my life that I don't have to worry about trying to learn a new skill? I have the skill that comes from inside. So uh, that was all divine. Uh, my whole life now has been a whole series of divine moments of me needing something, wanting something, and then meeting that other person who's either a connector or a somebody I call them, I call them the operators. They kind of plug me into the next thing that I need. You know? And there's always this, this kind of like six degrees of separation, whatever it is I'm looking for, I meet that person or I say to the angels, oh, great, I need another job. You know, the, this, are this mural is about to wrap up and I don't, I don't see it. Um, you know, but I believe it's there and the phone rings the next day. You know, I, I've become so used to this being a way of life for me that people who spend any time around me are like, I can't believe that this happens to you. And I said, well, you know, it's a practice makes perfect thing. The first thing is to know that that exists. That That's huge. That's a foundation. And then the next thing is, is to trust that that thing that you know exists is really does love you and really does want your best in mind. And then the other thing is, is to remember these words that we're speaking and the things that we're thinking because if I start getting negative and it's not going to happen, I'm not going to get a job, it's not going to come in, the phone's not going to ring, those things are self-prophecies. 
So I'm always staying positive. I know that the job is there. I know that the phone is going to ring. I know that this is going to happen. And even when I'm talking to other people, you know, that that spider web string, when I let them know what I need, they're talking to somebody else. They're talking to somebody else. I think it's uh, the first networking system. <laughs> you know, the, the, it, it kind of works like some of the other networking systems we now have that are, you know, you can touch, you know, like on the computer, but I think that's the original networking system. And and um, and I know it's hard for people to believe sometimes because it takes time to change your old habits. And you've got to have something in your heart that really wants to change those things in order to change your life around. But uh, that's why I'm writing the book to let people know, yeah, you can come from some hard stuff. You can come from some dark places and you can even not want to live anymore. And I know that feeling. And um, I know what it's like to contemplate suicide on a deep level and want to end things. And so I know what that feeling feels like. And then I know what freedom feels like from that experience. So I'm hoping that I can write something that will help people who don't feel like there's anything else there. And it will give them a, another way to look at things, another way to see life and living. Kelly, thank you for sharing your experience with us. Have you figured out what is the point for us to keep reincarnating over and over again? This was my my take on what they gave to me is that we are all all of us, all of all humans, all humans. We are basically um we're babies. We're baby gods and goddesses. And we're we're like an embryo. We're not even like born yet, right? We're we're still developing. But there's things inside of us in the human nature that uh, we are not given the scepter, so so to say, of that particular power and, and able to wield that power until we deal with those human tendencies. Because if we are given power without the understanding and the comprehension of what that power really is, um, we tend to misuse it and we tend to use it against others. And this is why we are, I think, from my experience, I think this is why we get reincarnated. And the reincarnation, I, I hate to say something so simple as like lessons, but really as as children and, and you know, children, we're not going to give children all the power if they don't even know what they're using it for. And so you get pieces of it. You get a little bit of it. So each lifetime is like we get a little bit more of the power or we we learn a little bit more about how we're misusing the power we already have some connection to. And so if we tend to use the power against others, and if we tend like the thinking in the words and the power, because it's all kind of one thing. And if we're using that against others, and if we're doing things to hurt others, then we're going to get another cycle of a life after that, in which, you know, that part of us starts to go away through different experiences, different people we're being born to different experiences in life. They're showing us that some of that is unsustainable, you know, like hating all the time is unsustainable because in hate where we're hurting others on a constant basis. And that's not what any human being wants. No human being wants to be in pain and nobody wants to pass it on to their children or see their children or their family or their loved ones in pain. But, you know, this is kind of what we're doing because of how we're speaking and what we're doing. So, so we're all very infantile and, and that's okay because this is, um, this is how we love one another. We love each other knowing that we are the imperfect things that we are, but also striving to be the better perfected things. And so God is a perfected thing or perfected entity, a perfected love. And so in that perfected love, like each lifetime, we're, we're, we're like getting another piece of that. We're adding that to our soul. And I think that at a certain point in our lifetimes, there's enough of that in us that we kind of start gravitating to it more often in the real world. So like there are a lot of people on this planet right now that are trying to do good, that are trying to stop the violence, they're trying to change what's going on. There are a lot of people who are waking up to war serves nobody, <laughs> you know? And we're also starting to look at what's where the puppet masters are kind of from. And we're like, oh, okay. You know, so it, there's more to it than we know. Like all of this is all kind of being thrown out there right now. So I think that that is because in each one of our hearts, we're deciding, who am I? Who is my spirit? Am I the person that wants to create the chaos and go through all this? Or am I the person who wants to try to, to help? And honestly, I think that if 
if you have one good thing to say to somebody, if you have one positive thing, like even like I said earlier, oh my God, you look so beautiful today. Like that can change, that can change a person's life. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a huge thing, small thing, but it has a lot of power. So I think that's what reincarnation and coming back is about, is about that perfecting of our inner nature so that we can kind of meet God in that middle space and receive our full power at some point. For those that have not had a near-death experience, what is the best way to confirm that the other side does exist? Moments of silence. I know it's really, really hard in this world to find a moment of silence, and it takes practice. I can tell you right now that if you can get your mind to think absolutely nothing for 15 minutes, you are a super person because it takes a lot to get the mind to be quiet. If you make a practice out of trying to quiet your thoughts, quiet your mind for as many seconds as you can, a couple of times a day, seconds, 15 seconds, it's all we really need. 15 seconds of just quiet, nothing going through our minds and breathing deep. We start to find that space, that little bit of space that we need to feel something bigger than where we're at. So I think that that's the first and the easiest step for people who've never had a life after death, who've never touched that divine love. You just need to quiet the mind for a little while, because in quieting the mind, you're going to open up space for these these esoteric type things to find a space within you, you know, so that the more positive love or the more positive vibration can come in. And I, and I know it's tough. I know it's tough. I know our world is very loud right now, but that's why it's so important. Have you ever considered creating a mural of your experience, like painting the beings or something? Um, I have lots of drawings of things I've experienced. I have the very first thing I drew, because I was not an artist. Um, I never drew or painted or did anything. I never went to art school before this experience. And after this experience, the very first thing that I drew was a picture of what I felt was, was um, I didn't even know what to use. I, I literally walked around the house and I grabbed, in fact, there's, there's, there's many experiences since the life after death. Okay. I've had many visions. Um, I've, I've had, uh, I, I met Jesus. And in this particular time, I was, um, I was sick. It was after my, my experience. Um, I was running out of money because I knew after my experience, I knew things were going to change. It took about a year for things to kind of really fall apart. But as they fell apart, I started to realize I wanted something different in my life. And through that, I was praying a lot. What is my thing? What is my thing? And so I had a little bit of money to live on. I had sold, I was a partner in a business. I sold that and I had some unemployment and stuff like that. And I knew I had like a certain amount of time and I needed to find my thing in there. And so um, I was, I was sick. And I think I was sick because I was worried, uh, you know, like, oh, my God, I'm going to lose everything because it was all starting to kind of crumble at that time. And in that sickness, um, I was deeply praying for help. And um, and and I had a vision in my room of Jesus coming to me. And we had a conversation like two regular people like we're having right now. And I was like, I'm scared. And, and he let me know I didn't need to be scared of anything, that he was my brother, that he was there for me and that you know, no matter what, that uh, there was help and that I had, I I was, you know, I was a bright being and that there was lots of good things that were still to come and that I needed to trust and I don't lose my faith, don't lose my way. And, and through that, I felt, I remember feeling inside that I did not deserve the love of God. That was a really big thing that happened in that moment. And I realized that I was holding myself back from that because I didn't believe I was worthy. I didn't believe I was worthy to be forgiven for anything that I had done. I didn't feel worthy of love. I didn't feel worthy of something great coming to me. You know, I felt like I didn't deserve those things. And so uh, my brother, I call him my brother, Jesus, but my brother came and sat down next to me. It was like, you do deserve all these things, you know, you, you and everybody else, you know, like we love you all. There's nothing but love for you. There's nothing, you were there. You, and I'm like, yes, yes, I was there. Yes. There is nothing but love. You're right. And so in, in, from that experience, I drew a picture of, uh, this is the first time I grabbed crayons and colored pencils. I had no no idea what to do. I'd never done anything, but I, I drew a heart of affliction with thorns around it with a couple of drops of blood coming out and coming out of the flames was Jesus and he had his arms open. And here I am kneeling at the bottom of his feet 
in the flames at the top of the heart, but I'm an angel with broken wings. And that's how I felt. I felt like I was this angel who had lots of broken wings and, and I was asking for forgiveness. I was asking him, please, you know, heal me and now let me be full. And that was the first thing that I ever drew or painted. And I think that was the first idea that I had that art was going to be something for me, but I still didn't know where to look. And so now like there's another year of me, you know, trying to figure this out. And, and eventually I, I'm running out of money and I go to my girlfriend's house and she went to lots of psychics and I said, you know, what, what, what am I going to do? And she's like, oh, I've been to, you know, 5,000 psychics. This is the best one. And she gave me a ticket and said, like, go talk to her. And I, I did, I made an appointment and I went to see her and I thought I had wasted my money and my time because during the session, I didn't hear anything that was going to help me. And then um, at the very last thing, she said, tell me about this man, this older man named Charles. I, I, I don't know him. And that night I met Charles and he was a mural artist. And it was just the most divine, unbelievable uh, coming together. A uh, year and a half I painted under his tutelage and, and a year and a half later I was making money on art. And so I, over time, these different visions that I've had about this experience, I've drawn pieces and parts of them. I would love to do a big mural about all of that, but I would need to self-fund it or I would need to find people who were really, really, really willing to fund something like that because I'm a different kind of mural artist. I don't use spray cans. I, I can't do a mural in three days. <laughs> I, everything I do is with my hands and brushes. And so, you know, some of mine are hundreds of feet long and, you know, 30 feet tall and everything's done by brush. And so uh, I have a, that's why mine hold their colors and that's why they last a long time because there's multiple, multiple, multiple layers of paint upon them. And uh, so yeah, I would love to do a mural like that, but uh, I'm, I'm going to need to be a little bit more independently wealthy in order to pick the place and uh, my medium and how long I want to work on it. <laughs> well, hopefully just us speaking about it just sent some energy down the web where that will come to you. I would love that. I would, I would love that because I'm writing a book about it too. So that would be great to put all of it together. <laughs> what an ending. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about what life was like living in your car and, and just day-to-day -day things? Like if you had to go brush your teeth, what would you do? So I have a great little story about that. Living in my car was, that was my test to myself. If I could keep my faith keep the faith that I had been shown and keep it in a deep way. It was very difficult. My journal got me through everything because I would, there I would lament my suffering. Now I'm not somebody who came from nothing. I, um, I, I didn't grow up rich, but my father started a business when I was a teenager. And by the time, you know, before 12, we, we didn't really have much. I mean, we had a humble home and we had humble things but from 12 to 18, my father started making a lot of money and our lives changed drastically because now we were in big houses. We were living in the rich neighborhood and everybody had a car. It was it was it was a little overwhelming. Um, but I realized, too, that it. Um, I was not the most grounded person in all of that, you know, that that became an identity. OK, and so living in the car was a way for me to disconnect from that the disconnect from the comfort that I had felt for so long, you know, cause, and I did work, I worked hard. I was working all kinds of jobs. That was because I thought I had a lifestyle I needed to keep up. That was because I, I thought I needed five cars and four motorcycles and three boats. And I thought that that was my markers of success because I was trying to match myself against my, my, my family and their peers and what they were making and showing with their money. And I, I, you know, I was very mixed up about, how that was supposed to be. And so the car was kind of like, um, I wanted, I wanted God to take care of me. I wanted to trust that I would get food when I was hungry, that I would get the shower when I needed it. And I didn't want to rely on making a phone call to somebody to send me a grand. You know, I didn't want to do that. And uh, I actually kind of got into a fight with my family because they thought I was crazy. And they, they didn't understand why I had the need to do what I was doing, but I followed through and so the journal got me through because in those moments where I was feeling sorry for myself, and that's really all it was, and saying I could, this could be so easy, 
And I was like, but it is easy. It is easy to trust in, in God when you've felt that love. It is easy to believe in Jesus when he's visited you. <laughs> you know, like it's you you need to stop thinking that this is hard because the rest of the world wants you to to, to tell you, no, that didn't happen. No, that, that doesn't occur, you know. And so there was like this, uh, I, I tell my grandchildren, it was the good wolf, bad wolf fight going on inside of me. Is it real or is it Memorex? Is it real? Did it happen? You know, and the car was that test. The car was the the way for me to to ground myself and find myself really truly in this world. And so when I would cry about not having eaten for two or three days, I would write that down in my journal, but I would end it with, dear Lord, please provide me with the food that I need. I'm asking you and I trust you and I believe in you. And the next day something crazy would happen. Like um, I would be someplace and someone would say, oh, here's a beer. I, I ordered two cheeseburgers. Would you like these two? You know, I'm standing someplace where you, they just came out. They'd be like, you know, this happened quite a bit. Now, this also reaffirms your faith because now you see strange things happening in your life that you wouldn't expect. And uh, one of uh, I do tell one good story about one time I, I had to go deliver a message for somebody and it was at a bar. And I, I walked into the bar and there was really nobody there. There was like a four or five people. But I, I sat at the bar and I said, I have a message for somebody. And they said, oh, they're not in yet, but they'll be here in you know 10 minutes. So I'm sitting there patiently waiting. I had no money. I walked to this place to to help this friend, you know, to give this message. And uh, I'm sitting there and a guy over on the other side of the bar orders a beer. And I thought, oh, I hadn't had a beer in so long. Wouldn't a cold beer taste so good? I was in Florida. Man, a cold beer would taste so good. But I knew I didn't have any money, so I wasn't going to say anything. And so um, I'm sitting there minding my own business and I hear her and the guy talking and she turns around, she comes to me and she goes, honey, would you like a beer? He ordered the wrong one and I already opened it. And I went, yeah, <laughs> but that's how they all happened. That's how the food happened. That's how the showers happened. It was, it was one of those things where someone would say, would you go do this? And I'm there. And it just got offered to me without me having to say I had a need or I wanted it. Nothing came out of my mouth. It was all within the feeling and it, everything was placed before me. And I learned in that, you know, couple of years there that this was what my life was going to be like. And so the more and more I worked on the murals and the more that I contemplated God and my experience, the more messages I got and the more um, clairaudient I became because I was tuning into it more. And uh, and that's how I got to New Orleans because um, I was living in Gainesville at the time and I was part of a mural committee there. I was doing a lot of murals. And uh, I got a message. I saw the hurricane coming up and I thought, oh, these poor people. And you can see this hurricane's going to go right into New Orleans. I'd never been there in my life. But I started praying deeply that the people be safe there. And I got a clear message. You will go to New Orleans. And I'm like, how am I going to get to New Orleans? And they're like, don't worry about it. But you are needed in New Orleans. We need you to go to New Orleans. And I was like, for what? And they said, all that love that you have in your heart, all that love that you've been charging up with, we need you to go and we need you to walk through New Orleans and put that plant of that love in your heart through your feet and into the ground because New Orleans is going to need a lot of love. And this is way before it hit. So I was on a, um, I was on a bus headed up to Buffalo to do a mural and I was on a Greyhound bus and this is after Katrina. And um, I meet two people on the bus <laughs> and they said, oh, what do you do? I said, well, I'm, I'm a painter. I'm a muralist. And they said, paint, you do painting? And I said, yeah, I paint. Well, you're good at it. I said, I'm great at it. And they said, well, we're working in New Orleans and we're doing the cleanup. We need a painter. And I said, really? <laughs> and I went to Buffalo and I did it and they sent me the plane ticket so I could go there and work. And that I went to New Orleans right after Katrina, and I knew that I had a mission even before I left. I knew I never said anything, but I knew what I was going for. And I would, uh, in between jobs, put my sneakers on and a backpack and a drawing pad and a pencil. And I would walk, and I walked the entire in the entire city of New Orleans after Katrina. There was nothing there. There was nobody there. The lights didn't work. There would be like one chicken place here or there. There was nothing open. But I walked the entire city for months and drew little drawings of things that I saw and put that love through my body into everything that I walked through. And it's it's kind of funny to go back to New Orleans now and walk around and see like where it came from, from what happened, because I was there right after. It was a, a very, very uh, wonderful experience. Do you feel that the other side is right here with us? 
but like in a different frequency, like changing the channel on a television or a, a changing the radio station? Absolutely. It is that simple. I know it sounds too simplistic for the human mind, but it, it it's all about frequency. And when you do breathing and you do your meditation and you quiet your mind, you 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 raise your vibrancy, you raise that vibration and you're meeting that that space. I I kind of think of it like the fourth dimension, right? We all know the fourth dimension exists. How do we know? Well, we've got quantum physics, we've got mathematics that can tell us all about it, but we can't see it. And as an artist, I'm always comprehending the fourth dimension, how to even try to show that in any kind of a painting or a piece of artwork. And sometimes I'll see something and I'll go, oh, that shows the fourth dimension beautifully. And in those moments, I say, and this is where spirit lives. This is where the beings that spoke to me are because they're there, but they're just in that next dimension. And without us having a way to see that or, or the way to meet that with our own vibration, we feel like it's someplace else, but it's not. And, and I think people know, I think people intrinsically inside know that they're there because things happen to everybody. Like you're in the car and you just missed the accident or your, you know, your tire went flat, but you ended up in front of the guy's place who'll change it. Like, you know, these are just such wonderful non-coincidence coincidences. And so the spirit world's always working with us. We just don't see them at work. We don't see them saying, okay, well, the tire is going to go. Let's, Let's let it go there and we'll they'll end up in a good spot. They'll be safe, you know. And uh, so they're watching out for us. They're watching over us and and they're they're waiting for us to ask for help because there is absolutely a uh, laws in the universe, you know, I first is thou shall do no harm. And so no spirit or no angel or no extra anything is going to involve itself with you unless you specifically ask it to help you for things. So um, I do know that that's true because I've been testing all this now for 20 something years, all of it, testing it, testing it, testing it, testing it, because I know it's real. But how do I how do I tell my grandchildren? How do I tell the people who've never had this experience how to create it in their life? My grandchildren are my favorites because when we talk about it, they're a little more open minded to what could be and they're more apt to try my little tests, you know, like. You want a banana? Well, let's manifest a banana. You want to you know, have love in your heart that you want the banana. Taste the banana. Think nothing good but the banana, you know, and then they'll call me and be like, yeah, somebody gave me a banana at lunch today. Well, that's that's kind of the fruition of, of your thought and your action and your feeling. So um, little tiny things like that help you. If you can if you can test yourself and you see it work in one small thing, you brought one small thing into your life, a drink, a Coke, a, a sandwich, you know, something really simple but wanted then you you tend to feel a little braver about trying something larger like i need a new life i need a, i need new partners i need new people around me i i need a new job those seem a much larger thing to overcome but it's no different than asking for a banana do you think it's best to verbally say what you want or just think it i think both of them are important i think the thinking is where you kind of round out your idea through the thinking you're thinking about Okay, I want a new job. What kind of job do I want? Now, if you want to talk to yourself, I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. That's a conversation you can have with yourself or a friend. But I do think that having the thought first is giving a structure to the word. Okay. And then once you've got that structure kind of set up, you say, you know what? I would love to be, I would love to work on a tugboat for a year. I would like that experience. And I I want to have that experience. And now you're you're matching with what you thought about, with what you're feeling in here. I really want that experience. I've always wanted that experience. I dreamed about this when I was a kid. There's a lot of energy and power behind that. And this signals, I think, to those beings around us, okay, this is something this person really wants. Now, consequently, talking about bringing nice things into your life, uh, you can bring some pretty bad things into your life too, by having the same types of thinking and the same types of desire. Like, you know, not wanting somebody in your life. I want this. I don't like this person. I hate them. I hate this job or whatever it is. You know, you're you're also putting that kind of energy into that. And that just makes your situation harder, makes it harder on you because you're you're faced with dealing with it. But now you're dealing with it and you're 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 very unhappy with dealing with it. And the only one that's you're really making unhappy is you. You're not making the business unhappy. You're not, you're not having any effect on anybody else. It's affecting your own health. It's your own system. So you're saying that if you keep thinking about things that you don't want and talking about it, 
you're going to attract it and pull it into you. Yeah, you're making the spider web. You're creating the spider web you're stuck in. <laughs> so yeah, you're you're bringing it right to you. And um and I think that this is the part of us all being gods and little, you know, baby gods and goddesses that this is the part we need to to understand. We are all born with the power. And we can take that power and we can make things work for us in our life and, and do good things or we can take that power and we can let it work against us and create these these you know, maybe not so great things. And, and yes, there are things that happen to children. Children are born into families that things go on, but they're, everyone is individual. We have our own will. So once, once a child is outside of that situation, that child now has the ability to decide what they're going to do with that. So is this thing going to define them and create more of it? Or is this thing going to be something they learn from and they're going to go in another direction? Because we all get the free will to make those decisions and changes and stuff. And my understanding from a situation that they immediately go into a different realm. They go into a more loving realm, a, a, a you know, a more understanding realm of some sort. It's a different place for children versus like an adult who's been out there doing some stuff. And, you know, after, after they've gone, um, you know, they're, what I understand is the next life that they're going to go into will address that situation. As you probably know, it's hard to quiet our mind and it's easy for it to wander into, you know, thinking bad things. What's the best way to kind of keep your mind on track and stay focused on positive things? So I, I call that brain training. <laughs> You you have your brain and your muscles and your arms are no different, and you've got to to work on it. So you know it it's, I, it happens to me. Let's let's get this clear. I get something in my head one day, and I say to myself, "Oh, this isn't going to work. This isn't going to work." And sometimes it takes a minute for me to catch myself and go, "What am I doing? I'm creating it not working." Like holy cow, because it does kind of slip out of your mind. And so it's called brain training, or you know, self discipline, self control. And so it, you don't have to, to expect a giant change today from you changing your mind, I think would be detrimental. I do think that if you just say to yourself, well, I'm going to start my diet today. <laughs> I'm going to start my exercise regime today. I'm going to start my brain training today. And today I'm going to try to think positive things. And when I catch myself thinking shit about something or someone, I'm going to say to myself, I forgive myself for thinking that and I'm going to think something better. And, you know, you don't have to share that with anybody, you know, so you say, okay, well, I was, you know, screaming at the bus driver in my head because he was taking too much time. And, you know, he was making me slow. And, and I'm sorry, Kelly, that I let that out. I'm sorry, Kelly, that, you know, because you're, you're forgiving yourself in that I, I'm sorry, you forgive yourself for having that bad moment and letting it go. And in doing that, you can send a little something to the bus driver, like I'm sending you some love. I'm sorry about, you know, my attitude. And that actually has an effect on you. It has an effect on your psyche because it's changing the thinking, it's changing the speaking, and it's changing that spider web again. So once you catch that you've been kind of laying out something that you don't really want, and you take a second to kind of like, okay, I did what I did, but now I'm going to change that tune. There's not kind of, there's no cleaning up necessary. There's no like going back behind it and doing it. There's just this you every in every second and every moment of every day you have a chance to start over and if it takes you a thousand times and you start to see cuz you will if you if you can get some momentum going you'll start to see the changes in your life even if they're little by little and that's going to give you the encouragement that you need to continue to try to do it so it's it's just one thing at a time pick one thing that you hate you know like there's a, maybe there's something a person that drives you crazy at work always driving you crazy at work now for my grandchildren it's easy for me to say this because they have this issue. Teachers, you know, this teacher rubbed them the wrong way. And I'll say to them, okay, but the teacher rubbed you the wrong way. And then you got angry. So you gave back that energy to that teacher, right? Yep. And it's continuing to go back and forth now. It's like ping pong, right? Yep. Yep. Every day, it's the same thing. I go in, they give me attitude. I give them attitude and doesn't get any better. My grades aren't any better. And I say, well, you know, I know you're not going to want to hear this, but it's coming from you because you're you're continuing to throw the ball back. You're continuing to give this back and forth with that teacher. I said, tomorrow when you go in there and the teacher starts giving you that stuff, I know this is going to be really hard, but look at their heart. 
Don't think about them as the teacher. Just look at their heart and know that there's a heart beating inside that chest. And that heart is connected to, to God, to the universe. And just love the heart. Just say, I love that heart. I love that heart. You know, I, I send love to that heart, even though the outside might be kind of crazy. Send that love and sit back and watch what happens. And don't repeat, don't say, don't give back the energy to that teacher. Just simply refuse to play in the game. And within a couple of days, you're going to see things change. And within a couple of days, they'll come home and they'll be like, mom, grandma, you're not going to believe this. The teacher was like really cool today and picked me to do the special thing. And, and my grades are going up and all the energy has changed in the classroom. Now, this happens with my grandchildren. We go through this on a daily basis because they're teenagers and they're testing their whatevers and they're running up against walls here and there. And we talk about this stuff quite often. Now, she might remember it today. But the next time that the teacher is giving her a hard time, she's going to forget that she has the power to change that. So it's it's this constant talking about it. It's it's like teaching anything else. You've got to remind yourself, I have the power to change this. It might take me a little while. It might I might have to really work hard to to try to love this ugly thing out there that I don't love. But um, I'm going to do that. And I, I would like to say that I learned that through a vision. And how I learned that was a. Uh, I had a, a relationship with my grandmother, my maternal, uh, my father's mother. And when she passed away, her and I were very close. And I said to her grandma, this is in 2002. So this is after my experience. And I said to her grandma, when you get to the other side, you can talk to me. Like you can send me messages. I'm working on, you know, fine tuning myself here. So come and tell me something. And she was gone quite a few years and she hadn't visited me in my dreams or anything like that. And I kind of, you know, probably forgot about it. And uh, one night I had a, a, like a dream type vision. And I remember not quite being asleep, but I had pictured myself walking down this neighborhood with these perfectly coiffed houses. And um, as I was walking, I heard my name, Kelly. And I turned to the side and I looked. And when I did, there was a, it was a house, but it was small and it was, it was more like a little castle and it had, you know, blocks for walls and stuff. And she was on the front porch in front of these really large doors. And she said, come here for a minute. I want to show you something. So I go up the stairs and when I enter into this home, it now looks much larger, like a real castle inside, but it's empty. There's no pictures. There's nothing. All there was, was a, at the far end across from the door was a, a fireplace, a big, huge fireplace. And on each side of the fireplace was two speakers, big speakers, like the kind you'd see at a concert. And I thought, that's kind of weird. And my grandmother was 98 years old, like in this vision. She was the old lady she was when she died. And uh, she walks over towards the speaker and she says, I want to I want to teach you something. And she turns around and she jumps up on the speaker like a like a teenager would jump up to sit down. And I went, oh, my God, my grandmother just, you know. My 98 year old grandmother just jumped up like five feet off the ground and sat on that speaker. And and um, and the door that we came through was a very large wooden door with glass in the center. You know, so like if you were standing in front of the door, you could see the outside and it was sunny where I outside. So I'm now in the middle of the room and my grandmother says, I want you to slowly turn around and look at the door. And as I turn around and I look at the door, it's very black and dark outside. And I re remember thinking, wow, it was just sunny out there. And all of a sudden, this demon beast hits the glass and starts banging on the glass with the crazy eyes and the hair all over the place. And my first reaction, of course, was pure fear. I was, and my grandmother said, no, like screamed at me, no. And I was like, what? And she said, I'm going to teach you how to change that. And she said, in your heart is a light. And she said, like a flashlight. And she says, but you've got to think love. You've got to feel love, feel love for something that you really love. And then put it into that light and feel that light like a beam going towards that door. Now, the whole time that beast is banging on there and trying to get in the door, you know, moving the door handle and making noise. And so I'm trying to calm myself down from this thing that wants to come and eat me and try to find the love. And it was really hard. I would just get this little tiny green light and it would just, just very tiny, small, like a pencil would come out. And she said, no, that's not it. That's not it. And I said, I don't understand. And she goes, Kelly, think of something that you love, that you just really love. And I started thinking about my children when they were babies and they were born and holding them in my arms. And all of a sudden my light got really huge. And it was like, as it went out in a cone, it went all the way to the door. And when it got to the door and it hit the door, everything changed and the 
the demon that had been standing there was this beautiful young woman with, with light brown hair. And the sunshine was behind her again. And this time when she turned the door handle, she walked right into the door. And she looked at me and she said, did you do this? And I said, I think I did. And she goes, oh, you set me free. Thank you so much. And she comes up to give me a big hug and I'm hugging her. And she goes, I don't know what to do now. And I said, well, you could travel with me. I'm traveling intentionally. And she said, yeah, I'll go with you. And I went to go turn around and say thank you to my grandmother. And my grandmother was gone. And I've never seen her again in another dream ever again. And I can't tell you how many times in my life since then I have remembered that dream because I will be faced with something that's scaring me. Could be a new mural. Could be going to a big meeting about a big mural. It could be something happened to my children or my grandchildren. It can be my, you know, my mom, something happened to my mom. Whatever that is, there's this fear that comes up. And in the moment that the fear comes up, I know that's the same fear I felt when the demon was at the door. So everything is the demon at the door when it's fear. And I remember to put my heart light on it and I put my love into it. And in the moment that I do that, I have changed whatever that was going to be. There's no fear at the meeting. There's no fear on the mural. There's no fear that when I go to the hospital, anything's going to be wrong. Like it has served me so well over the years. And I believe that that came from that experience. Kelly, if people want to check out your murals, do they go to your website? Yes, they can go to my website at kellycurrymurals.com. They can also find me on Facebook. I have a Kelly Curry murals page and a Kelly Curry page where I upload paintings and drawings and different things that I do there. After watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? And if so, how do they contact you? I'm open to that. They can contact me through my website at kellycurrymurals.com. They could also send me a direct email at kellycurrymurals.com. Or, sorry, kellycurrymurals at yahoo.com. Well, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? That we are all brothers and sisters. And that we are all one part of a large body. I like to say, when you look at your body, and we all know that we're made up of billions of cells, billions and billions of cells. If God was a body like this, all of us human beings would literally be a cell, which means that without the cell in the finger, the hand doesn't work right. So we all are brothers and sisters. We are all from the same love space and that we need each other all together in order to change the world that we see right now into something that we can use our God-given powers in and do well. Kelly, thank you for your message and thank you for being my guest. Thank you for having me today. I really appreciate it. God bless. Thank you and God bless you. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.